Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Those of you who grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, may, may remember him as Alan Cabral. Alan Blitz has since been pumping out great rock tunes. Blitz is a Brazilian Canadian, 2S LGBTQI plus singer songwriter based in Toronto. He previously worked for the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra and today is a photographer and digital content creator for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. His latest song, Alien, is a pride hard rock anthem for the 2S LGBTQI plus community. He also has a thing or two to say about policies that discriminate against marginalized communities, especially the 2S LGBTQI plus. Across North America, there are conservative politicians who feel the need to rally hate against a group of people who have largely been in hiding most of their life and only coming out into the light when they felt safe in their own circles. Please welcome Ellen Blitz. Hello, <laughs> happy to be here. For those unfamiliar with Canada, the province of Alberta is often described as redneck and staunchly conservative. <laughs> One can only imagine how non-accepting it might be for someone growing up queer. When did you feel safe enough to come out? And what was the response like from your family and friends? So there are a few layers to that question that I can share. Um, growing up queer first, kind of, you know, it's a time of essentially, so my teenage years about like from 2000 to 2010, essentially a time of self-discovery, I think in a person's life. And you know, sometimes you just go day by day and you're trying to understand yourself. Um, you have these thoughts and you ask yourself, are these thoughts truthful, you know? So every day is, you try to navigate not only the world, but also what's within you by that time actually so uh, as you said like I, I am brazilian canadian at the time in my teens i was actually in brazil and i moved to canada actually in my early 20s and you were asking about coming the coming out experience so to me to me th what really made clear okay no i am definitely a queer person <laughs> i am definitely at the time, at the time, I was like, um, I still use the word gay. Sometimes I go, I, I, I use the word gay and queer to identify myself interchangeably. But at the time, what really said like, no, this, this is what it is. This is what I want to be. It was basically the fact that I could have developed feelings specifically for um, another human being of the same sex. Because up until that point, uh, until my early 20s, before my first relationship, I thought, um, maybe, you know, like, maybe it's more of a physical thing. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's going to pass because that's sometimes what you think it, it will happen. Uh, and obviously it doesn't. <laughs> obviously it doesn't. Not only that, but you, you, you develop feelings for somebody of the same sex. So to me, that was like, okay. Now this is getting more serious. Um, so you were in your 20s when this was happening or is this before? So my coming out, yes. My, 20, my coming out was in my 20s. And I told my parents, I told my parents, my mom was okay with it. My, my father definitely wasn't. <laughs> my father definitely wasn't. Um, everything's fine now. I can say that. Everything's fine. I think it took him just a learning curve. And I think love spoke higher. Uh, 
And I'm very grateful for that because he's a very important figure in my life. But in the teenage years, as I was saying, it can be a very complicated time of self-discovery. So to me, I've lived many years just really confined, really, really, really confined. Um, definitely, I was the the you know the isolated kid in the classroom. People would often you know raise concerns, "Why are you always so sad?" kind of thing, uh, and. I didn't understand it myself too, because I thought it could be something. I thought that I was wrong, of course, right? Because well, you're raised time, that way. You're raised to think like exactly it's wrong, that's what right? society preaches. And some countries, you know, it's illegal for some reason. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And that's what society preaches. Yeah. So obviously I was like, well, I hope this thing passes. I hope. I am cured. I'm healed. Obviously, that was not the case. And I'm grateful it was not the case. Um, so, you know, very complicated years as a growing up queer a around that time, I would say. I personally feel that after 2010, there was a major shift, um, uh, it, even in terms of support of mainstream media, mm -hmm. amplifying queer themes, uh, news, causes, and essentially a, a, a major shift, I think, started happening. I think there's definitely still a lot of work to be done, and that is something that I actually try to do with my music. Because of those formative years, yeah. I think that's something, the queer themes is always something that I'm trying to include in my music the challenges of everyday life. <laughs> I have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And with some of the, these emulating policies, like what's in Florida and some of the other states and countries, you know, it's kind of shocking that Alberta is about to implement some of these sweeping changes that will impact trans, gender, youth, gender affirming care and sex education. And considering how, Canada has been literally um, open-minded and open, at least federally practicing openness. The CBC story reported Alberta Premier Daniel Smith described policy changes that would put minimum legal age limits on surgeries and hormone therapies for transgender youth. It will require parental notification and permission, depending on the student's age, if a student wants to change their name or pronoun at school. How dangerous is it for transgendered youth and really anyone who does not identify as cis when you are faced with this kind of thing? Um, first, personally, I was really appalled when I read about the news, so I just kind of opened the news and even actually opened Instagram and then actually, oh no, this, like, is this actually true? And then I went, saw the Globe and Mail, I was like, okay, wow, it is actually true. What I can relate is really to my experience. So let's take, for example, a few different components, actually, that this policy encapsulates. So you were saying about parental notification even and that's not even from I would say even a trans perspective like it is in, in this particular case it is about the trans community in particular but even as a person who is queer I relate to my experience because I feel like if I were put in a position where my parents were notified that, hey, Alan is having challenges in school, he's, uh, or Alan, Alan is, he is demonstrating interest for a person of the same sex, I don't know how they would even like verbalize that, to be quite honest. To me personally, that would have been very, very, very harmful. Um, because 
And I think when looking back, the time that I came out in my life around 21, I think it was quite crucial because I kind of had some power and some independence already. You know, like I, you know, if I, I didn't, it was, this was not necessary, but if I wanted to live somewhere else, I could have, you know, but as a teenager, you don't have, you basically do not have those options. Looking back, it was a different time. My parents definitely love me, but I don't feel in my memories that they would be in a position to understand that, understand myself at that time, if that happened. So it just kind of makes me think, and even I could even infer that it kind of makes me think, you know, I'm not so sure even if I would be here right now, yeah. to, be quite honest, to be quite honest with you, because it would have been that harmful to me. Um, I was very, very, very scared of being part of, you know, the LGBTQ2S plus community. And obviously I'm not nowadays, but I didn't have this understanding in the early 2000s as a person of like in my 13 when I was 13 or 14 right I was a, it's, I was a child and having somebody literally take if save that option had been taken away from me of choices and free will choices that are connected to my free will as a person that would have been a hundred percent very harmful so that is one component of the policy that to me was very, um, wow. I, I immediately thought of myself, you know, of back in those days, like I, this is very, um, this can be very, very, very harmful. Yeah. It seems more less about healthcare because really gender affirming, reaffirming care is healthcare. And it isn't just about, one gender to another it could be anything yes. um it seems more like scoring political points but i wonder i shudder actually to think what you just said because there are some parents who are not especially mm -hmm. in this province accepting and i fear for the suicide rates i mean they're high enough as it is amongst this group of people so how I, I can imagine these types of policies make it even worse very much so again like I relate to my experience it would have been very very harmful to me psychologically it would not have created a psychological environment for me to to grow like literally grow right because as a teenager those are your formative years and not only your body is changing but also you're learning about life you're learning about yourself having having that option I guess taken away from you and literally the government saying you can't be this way or you can't be this way until you turn 18 um yet the federal government is okay with it <laughs> I know. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I, that's yes. one of the things that I ask myself, like, how's this thing, how is this even legal on a federal level at first? That's a good point, Ella, because when you are, mm -hmm. you're 12, 13 years old, you don't have the life sense to think about class action lawsuits. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You don't. So who's going to fight for you, right? So the only option you see is A, the S word or mm -hmm. H homelessness you know i think those issues are going to grow we've had a lot of protests in the schools that the other kids in the schools are not taking this mm -hmm. you know that aren't part of that community they are not taking it laying down they are they are fighting for their friends so there's that hope so whether it goes anywhere in this province i don't know but at least there's that and there's also a different another component. Uh, I also saw a note that was issued by the Alberta Medical Association mm -hmm. saying that whenever you have 
agents that, okay, sure, they induce puberty to stop. So, you know, as soon as you stop those agents, you, the treatment, puberty will continue. So it's not like it's completely irreversible too. Yeah. So, and the thing, it's not black and white. This is not a black and white issue. And that's kind of how it's being approached mm-hmm. as if it's like, Life is never linear as it is. It's always like in paths. Um, And that is essentially the life of what uh, a person that is from the LGBTQ2S plus community is about. (laughs) It's usually all of our lives. Um, It's never a linear path. So it, it really scares me when I see that level of support, even uh, on a healthcare level, being taken away yeah. uh, this and definitely some of the saddest things is definitely t- the choice being taken away as well so you know um we gotta push back <laughs> yeah. so we gotta push back and that's exactly to me what my song alien because that's something that you mentioned before i'm just kind of i'm just mm-hmm. connecting to it um to me, that is something that, you know, like writing about the queer themes that in the chorus, I say, I'm an alien, but the problem is you. <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> I'm an alien, but the problem is you. Um, and it is. Well, it's you. <laughs> it's you are the problem. <laughs> that, 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 that's kind of what I... Yeah. Really what I believe. Like, there's nothing wrong about it. And sometimes human beings as human beings we get so scared when a a concept is foreign to us um and yet sometimes we do very little to educate ourselves but alan who the hell cares who the hell cares exactly why do i care what's going on in the next department if it doesn't affect me right it's exactly who the hell cares (laughs) and that's the thing you know But then you see, like, it wouldn't affect you or, like, someone, somebody else for that matter. Sure. Uh, I know you didn't mention yourself specifically. I know, I know. (laughs) Yeah. And I am cis, by the way, so. Yeah, yeah. But, like, it wouldn't (laughs) affect you. But, and yet, at the same time, okay, so we can think of an example. Okay, so you have a trans teenager that has inclinations for to become you know like a healthcare professional perhaps Mm -hmm. a doctor right you know and they find themselves in a position okay like i'm in this province that doesn't support me for who i am to me that's got to be discouraging that's got to be discouraging in the sense of like this medical this healthcare system doesn't even support who i am and it's creating, it's creating a un, an unsafe psychological environment. Mm-hmm. So many things could go wrong here. And we could literally lose, and it doesn't affect you directly, but we as a society, it, it affects us because we lose talent. You know, we, we lose talent while well, we lose friends. Yes, we lose friends, we lose talent, we lose family. Um so yeah, you know, it's it doesn't affect affect micro, but it affects ma- macro. Yeah. Yes. Well, and and being a creative myself uh, mm-hmm. in the creative industry, a lot of people in the creative industry are part of the two S L G B T Q I plus community. A yes. lot. <laughs> Yes. That says a lot about the creativity and the skill set, but it, I mean, it would be a loss. I mean, we're already, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the, the brain drain is already bad enough in this province. So <laughs> it would be really hard to see that. And of course, it's being applied to athletics as well. So, yes, somebody's say there's a college basketball. I don't even know, or a high school basketball uh, player, a few girl, and they are, you know, queer. 
she's going to get she's going to be told she can't play basketball anymore mm -hmm. and that exactly connects to the the choice the life choices being taken away and just that fact itself not even um now which transcends the healthcare system issues are just another layer mm -hmm. to the complexity of how these policies can really affect trans people, our community, the 2S LGBTQ plus community, and which is important, which is why I really appreciate like even us having this conversation to sh shine a light on these causes, you know, um, this is really necessary. The world hasn't been really a good place nowadays. No, it's, so, it's, so it's work. We, we know that. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, and again, yeah, with my my song, honestly, I just I just want to empower. Mm -hmm. I am a five six guy screaming my lungs out. <laughs> well, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. It's just like just really. <laughs> We yeah. have to keep doing that. We have to keep speaking out and uh, doing what we can to to try and make it better. So let's let's dive even a little bit deeper into why this is so important. Now, I mean, the people making these policies don't really give a damn, I don't think. So we could tell them and they're not going to listen. But for everybody else who is not affected directly like you say not being able to express yourself authentically has to take a toll because people just want to be seen as a human being so for those who don't understand can you explain what it is like to hide your identity to live in constant fear of being found out and the unknown repercussions that could happen as a result. That is definitely a complex question. There's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of layers to it. Not expressing oneself. Um, during all my teenage years, I definitely felt like I was a bird in a cage, to be honest, from, I would say, yeah, from like about 12 to, you know, 19, 20, yeah, 19. Not being able to speak out your truth, especially in those formative years, it kind of, well, not kind of, but it does set the tone for everything else that comes after that I can tell you uh, I can share a little bit even of my personal experience and even with singing honestly so about when I was about 12 13 years old I suffered a gigantic trauma actually that it relates to kind of relates to my queerness I used to sing very beautifully before that and singing is part of my expression, right? That's why I'm I'm talking about it. It's part of my the way that I self-express as a person. So I had this ability to sing as a child. <laughs> and after this particular trauma, I completely lost it. Like it was simply gone. It was because it got me into a state of complete feeling lost. It comes to mind the analogy of the bird in a cage. And I just completely lost my voice. I was like, I, I might as well. I might as well be dead. <laughs> you know, like I might as well be dead if I can't, if I can't even speak. So, you know. That's what I was saying. It's uh, as a queer person growing up, it can some, some days be one day at a time, sometimes an hour at a time. Um, 
So funnily enough to me for the singing in, in the case of my singing, I actually had to work very hard for it again. <laughs> I kind of, so I, cause I knew what I wanted to do with my voice if I had the voice back, but in terms of like expressing myself, I, I just felt that my heart was compressed, crushed with everything, you know, everything that the world had. And that came from multiple sources at that time. It came multiple, by sources, I mean, came from school, sometimes came from home. My parents are very different nowadays, but- Churches, yeah. Yeah, churches, yeah. So it came from very various, it's very difficult not being able to express your, your voice, which is your choice, not to be not being able to imagine going through your day always with intrusive thoughts no don't do that it will it will look too gay or like oh don't don't do that uh and if it does look too gay you have there is there is a risk that you'll get beat up um don't make it look too gay don't don't watch your voice watch your voice tone like don't don't speak too high <laughs> and it's things like that and it's just impossible to live this way you know it's just impossible to live this way for a person like me what happens to me I implode I don't explode I implode which to me Coming out when I was 21, so just out of my teens, that to me was a milestone in terms of like action taking in my life. You know, yes, I am taking charge and taking responsibility for who I am. And it was the best thing I've done for myself. <laughs> Honestly, it was the best thing that I've done for myself. Um, I can't and I can't understate the power of expressing oneself yeah. and finally I get the chance to even do that through my music so alien is about that you know like this yeah. my this and it's not like people are still gonna ostracize you for being who you are and all that bull crap but it's just like you said you're in a space you have to be in that space where you're mature enough or you feel strong enough that you can, you know, mm -hmm. bounce off those slings and arrows and, uh, yes. and on your true self. Yes. And honestly, I think there's even, I love that you said that because that's been something that's been on my mind lately. Um, it's very different when you have people that love you but don't understand, you know, yeah. the queer situation. That hurts more. Because, <laughs> you know, people, at the end of the day, like, just, like, the, you know, people ostracizing me, as you said, like, at the end of the day, I know my truth. I know my truth. And that's, sure, some, I may not like what they said, or, or you know, like, it may, it may hurt me to a, some level. But it flows out of me and I, I move on with my life pretty easily. Now it's different when you have like people that love you, right? And yeah. they are they are they don't understand or that is a foreign concept. So to me, the these policies are kind of feeding into that, you know, like it, it can feed into the risk because when it's it's one thing, it's a person you being attacked by somebody you don't know. Mm -hmm. It's another thing being you know losing the support of somebody that loves you for example just simply because they don't know that's deeper yeah it that is deeper. that is very much deeper simply because they don't understand at the end of the day some will say well if they love you they will not leave yes i think i agree with that to be honest and that's usually the case yeah <laughs> but it, it's hard. yeah honestly but it's hard it's something that we all should be trying to understand together and not and not dividing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it you're right. It's <laughs> it's not black and white. It's there's so many layers to it. And your songwriting, when you write these songs, 
it's I call it bleeding on the page. <laughs> yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yes. When you're putting your personal stuff out there, you're bleeding on the page. How much of that is also kind of therapeutic at the same time? Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally. To me, because it's like, um, so funnily enough, to me that this particular song, the image that I have in mind when I wrote it is 10-year-old Alan in a field trip and so many kids just making fun of me, you know, just making fun of me in a, in a very unhealthy way. Um, and I just, for this particular song, and back then, 10-year-old Alan, I just remember feeling this uncontrollable feeling of anger, <laughs> you know, like, which is why, uh, obviously, I my anger never really expressed physically <laughs> and i can say that i am a, i'm actually a loving human being but i can express i can express that in a song that's for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah you know helping me kind of connect to those those memories those feelings that hey that happened in the past and i still think about it <laughs> that's stuff that stays with you for the rest of your life and that's the thing that's the, that's exactly what we were just talking about of like these um formative years are so important because it sets the tone yeah it sets the tone i can imagine that now i think th things are a little more a little healthier let's put it that way in terms of I like, don't know. <laughs> like like in the school environment I, yeah I, yeah, yeah. The like, other kids will band together yeah yeah maybe at the time that I grew up not so not so much um yeah. but uh yeah so I uh I like like what you said bleeding out on the page that's kind of what it is um and yet I had people tell me like well it is through the dark that we find the light. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is some truth to that, but yeah, it's kind it of. It is through the dark that we find the light. <laughs> sure, I'm just. I, I know I just like moody music. I, yes. Meanwhile, let me turn on some uh, Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> yes, exactly. I just yes. To let my frustrations out. I will say though, the song is. Um, I did create the song to. Uh, not only empower others, but empower myself for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's a good song. That, yes. Especially that hurt child, I would say. Yeah. And, uh, and it has to relate to a lot of people. You know, if it if it's that meaningful to you and it's that personal, that somebody else needs to hear it, right? Mm -hmm. There is somebody else out there that is that 10-year-old Alan that. Yes that song reaches absolutely uh and feeling like an alien right feeling just like yeah like you don't belong it's challenging because it sets because you want to belong in those formative years you want to belong i did at least i yeah. really did and i just i just couldn't or when i tried i got pushed back so yeah yeah so I wrote about that. <laughs> yeah, and that's got to help. Hopefully that uh, helps somebody else too. Let's talk a little bit about photography. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and what... get to more of what you're doing now too. Talk about this relationship between music and photography because photographing musicians mm -hmm. is a specialty art form. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, not everybody gets it right. So what's the key to getting that right? Honestly, so to me, so I've been, I've been doing photography for like since my early 20s. Uh, for concert photography, I've been doing for about five. I would say I just try to capture the truthfulness of the moment, you know, like the truthfulness and raw feelings of the moment. I feel like that, with vulnerability comes there's great power that is shown and shared to the audience um when a performance chooses to really express their emotions 
whether they are a soloist, whether they are a section player in the orchestra, whether they are the conductor, actually. Here at the Conductor Symphony, our music director is so expressive. He's a joy to work with. <laughs> He's a joy to work with. I love him. Um, and yeah, so I, I try to capture those emotions so that the photography will kind of tell the story of that particular moment when it happened. Um, and you can almost tell, yeah, that was a good that was a good concert just by looking at at the mm -hmm. at the photos, right? Yeah. So yeah, I love I'm I'm I feel grateful and very fortunate to work with something that not is a passion, actually. Uh, I love photography. It kind of combines two passions. It does. I, absolutely. And I get kind of to watch the concert by proxy, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of got, so that's a perk to got to watch the concerts and sometimes hang, you know, like work one on one with the soloists too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So I had the privilege of really uh, getting to know Yo-Yo Ma, the, you know. The oh, child. nice. So that was that was so nice. Not only sure, sure he's yo yo ma, but he just had this lightness to him that I I, I don't I can't quite describe. Like his he had this lightness, this of his aura. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna use that word. He he would emanate this positivity and and it, it just really stuck with me. You know, like the, he really stuck with me. Um, such a humble person and that came across you know it comes across in his performance yes yeah. yes his personality comes across in his performance so that makes me think you know like yeah it does it like the the queer the the poly, it doesn't affect us but then it does because yeah. if the performer is trans and if they if they are thinking about that they're struggling in their minds you know that does affect the performance and like um hmm. and I have seen trans performance by the way. Um, yeah, well of course but, <laughs> but in, of classical, <laughs> in classical music, yes, in classical yeah. music. Um yes. Good memories actually. Yeah. You have an eclectic taste from Judas Priest to classical to Michael Bolton to your mom singing Brazilian in the kitchen. Oh my god, yes. You work for classical music company um what is it about rock music what that seems to be the genre you chose to write your songs and mm -hmm. do you have plans to open your music to other genres um okay so two questions there yep. <laughs> One, the music to the other genres and rock music so let's do rock music first rock music um honestly the it does relate to the fact of like being a queer person because at the time live like just trying to understand myself um with that it came a lot of feelings of anger frustration um grief perhaps you know mm -hmm. like you kind of grieve something that you can't be you grieve a reality that's not achievable um so it was very easy for me to just listen to heavy rock aside from the fact that as a child i would hang out with my sister in her bedroom and that's all she would hear <laughs> so and so as so and then later in my teens um as i don't know say a band like Metallica or Iron Maiden, for example, it's like, yeah, that sounds really good. Now it hits me. Mm -hmm. Now, now I really feel that in my bones. Um, and you know, that's probably rock music is one of the only genres that does that to me. Like I, I have usually a visceral experience. And do you um, have like a certain playlist that's like your really angry playlist like where you could spit nails <laughs> no not too much nowadays I definitely did and in, in my teens you know like I used to listen to quite dark music times and uh 
<laughs> because it would help me just process yeah. it. But you know, like, it's funny because like one song that I can even think about, about right now, I'm going to say like a, maybe a main, mainstream song, like Smells Like Teen Spirit, for example. Yes, yeah. So, gosh, you, you got to feel something when you hear that. Or, <laughs> like, or Bird in a Cage. <laughs> yes, you got to feel something when you hear that. Um, Smashing Pumpkins, yeah. Yeah, so I liked... But that hit, my point is, I liked that kind of energy. It smells like Teen Spirit energy or like yeah. metal. Metal music would do that for me. Um, and then the other aspect of it is like how I, I guess I became a vocalist was that I was so intrigued and inspired really by the singing, the style of singing, mm -hmm. which was like controlled and yet aggressive and but it's like oh but they know what they are doing and yet sometimes it's operatic yes so I started that really is like yes I that's what I want to do like I I want to study voice I want to become a really good vocalist and that's you know like after I was I was telling him before that's really when I started reclaiming my my power I guess as a singer, before, the child that would be used to be able to sing, lost it lots lost its ability and then came back. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know that's one aspect. So, and then of course it would obviously help me with being queer, processing all of that. And then the second point to your question was uh, different genres. And the answer to that is definitely yes. And it's not only that, but it's done already. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> it's not only that, but it's done. I have, but then you see, like you said, I have, I have so many different influences from rock, metal, yes. pop, classical, musical theater. I want to My hear it all in one song, though. <laughs> I think you can. I think you kind of can. And honestly, my first, my date, and I got to tell you, because like my debut single is, it's you can kind of hear everything. Yeah, to be yeah. honest. My debut single, single Reborn, not, not Alien. So my debut single Reborn, because there it's kind of a pop song, but it has like electric guitars. I sing like a rock singer. And then I have a really gentle side to myself. You can hear the musical theater in the vibrato. You can hear the classical because I'm playing the harp on that song. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it all kind of comes together. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yes, I have plans of like right now, everything that I have released so far is more rock related. But I have plans of releasing other genres. I actually have one song that is just you know piano voice and cello so that you know a little more gentle um a little more exposed i would say and it's called join the sky actually um and talks about grief you know so i'm okay i'm okay talking i'm okay singing about grief and being very gentle yeah yeah <laughs> because, I, because we have to be gentle with ourselves whenever we are yeah. grieving, I guess. <laughs> so if you could collaborate with any artist in the music verse, who would yes. it be? Oh my gosh. <laughs> One, a few names to come to mind. Um, <sighs> the dream growing up would be Chris Cornell from Soundgarden, obviously. Oh, wow, yeah. Yes, it would have been him. He was my all-time, Chris Cornell was and is my all-time hero, not only vocally, but I would have these dreams of, um, yeah, you know, I'm still, I'm in my 20s. Chris is relatively young. There's like, and then I would imagine, okay, there's like 30 years from now, what if we cross within these 30 years, we cross paths one time, you know, like, yeah. so definitely that would have been, you know, like 
that would have been amazing, um, uh, to say the least. Um, his legacy is just to me as a songwriter, as a vocalist, uh, it's beyond, you know, it's, yeah. it really is beyond. Um, Chris is no longer with us, but bless his soul. Right now, <laughs> what another name now completely different. <laughs> But a name that comes to mind is Sia, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's great. A name that comes to mind is Sia. I love the style of, you know, yeah. I love the style of her music. I love the singing. I like her story as a person, too, which I really identify. She also has been through a lot of struggles. So I feel like she would be a person that is it would be easy to get in the flow to mm -hmm. you know like yes i also have a, <laughs> as a canadian i also have a uh, a very deep love for celine dion <laughs> i also have a very deep yeah. love i love that yeah. i went from like a like a rock star but celine my god celine yeah. i will probably one of she's probably one of the reasons why i even started singing to be honest um mm -hmm. i remember this commercial as a child i still remember this to this day just looking staring at the tv and it was celine singing the song was to love you more um and she was holding this note for forever she was like just giving it and i just remember thinking like wow, what a fantastic, what a great singer. I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. Um, and then on road trips, my mom would actually always play Celine Dion in the car and it was the best. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best. <laughs> um, so yeah, but of course, these, yeah. these are... You never know what the future will hold. Well, Chris is that Chris won't be Chris unless it's AI, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you never know. You never know. You never know. At so, the end of the day. Yes. what can we as a community or individuals do to make a difference to support the 2SLGBTQI community with all this? going on and to support you know just the community in general in the first thing that comes to mind is that if the support is being taken away on a macro level from the government even just reaching out and showing up and demonstrating that you are present and that you are willing to fight together, that you're willing to support them through this journey. From my experience, that would have made all the difference already. You mm -hmm. know, it's not all of it. It's not all of it. I will say that. Yeah. Uh, but it's something, you know, it's something yeah. and it's a step taken. So to your question, what can you do? Action verb, take action, you know? So reach out. If you know somebody who's queer, reach out. If they're struggling, if they don't know about resources, I certainly did not know about resources. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe if you, if you feel up for it, share resources with them. And if you know of resources, and, you know, and if you feel inclined to it, educate yourself about resources that you can yeah. share. You know, I don't like I don't like saying you have to do this, you have to do that. You know, because essentially, I don't want I don't want my freedom of choice being taken away. I don't want anybody else's choice. Freedom Nobody does. Choice. It starts with the most marginalized communities, and then it keeps going. Right? That's how this works. Yes. So. Um, so yeah, show up show up that's that can make a huge difference more than what people can imagine sometimes 
Yes. Well, I am encouraged that there are many people in, in Alberta who have been expressing their, uh, you know, protest against this going down. So we still have four and a half years left to the next elections. I don't know what's in store in the future, but that's great advice. And I will I will look for some resources and put them in the link to this YouTube. And, and to your point, so. and reach out, and but definitely like reach out and make make yourself loud to the people who are in power, right? And oh that's, yeah, that, that oh, can be understood. <laughs> like the, the people true. who are who actually are making, who have written these policies, and who, for some reason, may have la a lack of empathy for yeah. the consequences of implementing these policies. And I would have only really been affected. I can, I can say that with confidence, actually. And whether it's Alberta, whether it's Florida, doesn't matter where it is, Saskatchewan's got the same policy, I think. Um, wherever it is in the world, there is probably some petition, there's some pushback on it that everybody can research in their own communities and, and jump on, even if it's just signing a petition against that policy. So good advice. Yes. Raise your voice. Raise, Raise your voice. voice. <laughs> Raise your voice. Absolutely. Showing so, up. Part of showing up is that. Raising your voice. Yes. Yes. Alan, thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. It's been a pleasure. Right on. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.